Hey everyone, this is Lloyd on Hawaii, also known as LA Smooth and the Great Alofa. And right now I'm here on this podcast introducing Kings of the Ring. So stay tuned because you're going to hear a lot more. Episode 6 marks the appearance of our first ever special guest voice actor in the form of international wrestling veteran L.A. Smooth, a.k.a. Head Shrinker Alofa, son of WWE Hall of Famer Afa the Wild Samoan, who has also been a staple of the Puerto Rican wrestling scene for well over 25 years as the Tahitian Warrior. He was not only consulted in the painting of this world in Puerto Rico, but also lends his voice acting talents, adding to his growing resume after working in the historic Mickey Rourke film, The Wrestler, as one of the Funky Samoans, and the upcoming Matt Rats movie. Kings of the Ring is wrestling's first audio drama podcast, depicting a fictional version of the 80s wrestling scene, presented like a soap opera or cable TV drama series. If this is your first time listening to Kings of the Ring, you're going to want to go back to binge listen from episode one to catch up on the story, just as you would any other cable drama series. Kings of the Ring is available on virtually any podcast app or listen directly from the website kingsotr.com. Previously on Kings of the Ring, Carolina Wrestling Association owner Daniel Hawkins tipped off Donnie Gold that his upcoming title defense in Puerto Rico was on the verge of drawing a record crowd, and Donnie told Julian Kane that he wanted to finish a final week of dates before officially jumping to Empire. Julian reluctantly accepted this at the prospect of having the number one draw, the number one wrestler in the world, and the current WWA world champion on the EWF roster. Today's episode would be rated MA for sexual dialogue, profanity, and drug use. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kings of the Ring. Caribbean Championship Wrestling. Diamond Donny Gold. The WWA World Heavyweight Champion. The number one wrestler in the world is coming. <laughs> oh yeah. The man who is all class, all style, and pure excellence from head to toe. Donnie smiles as he displays his diamond rings, cufflinks, and necklaces to the camera. Diamond Donnie Gold is forced to wrestle someone like Carlos Rivera. And in all places... A- Oh, like San Juan, Puerto Rico? When I was a child growing up in the United States, at the finest schools that money can buy, learning about science and computers, Carlos Rivera and all the other stupid Puerto Rican animals were sitting outside playing in the mud. Unbelievable. But the one thing Puerto Rico has is your women. <laughs> oh, yeah. Girls. Ages 18 to 29, leave your boyfriends and husbands at home. I'm staying at the penthouse suite at the Hilton. Because after I get done slapping around Carlos Rivera, get ready for the golden boy all night long. Because Diamond Donnie is coming to Puerto Rico, and he's making babies. (laughs) Oh, yeah. King to the Ring, Episode 6, Donnie Does Puerto Rico. San Juan, Puerto Rico. San Juan Airport. The door and stairs to the small airplane open, and out steps Diamond Donnie Gold. His long, bleached, feathered blonde locks are flowing as the ocean breeze blasts him in the face. The hot, humid air thick enough to feel as Donnie angrily straightens out his tight pink polo shirt and tan khaki tight pants as he's already flustered about something. At the bottom of the stairs he is greeted by the promoter Miguel Estrada. Miguel is wearing a white suit and an open button silk shirt underneath with lots of gold around his neck and on his fingers. He nervously smokes a cigarette as he puts on a big smile for the arriving world champion. Welcome to Puerto Rico! Jesus Christ, Miguel, where'd this fucking pilot get his license from? A box of Cracker Jacks? He dropped us to that landing in about five seconds, so my life passed right before my eyes. Miguel puts his arm around Donnie's shoulder and leads him to a limo. Miguel is accompanied by two heavies. They take Donnie's bag. No, no, no. We're going straight to the airport bar. I'm shaking like a leaf. 
Donnie, we should really be going. Donnie ignores Miguel and strides into the airport, where he immediately sits at a table and waits to be served. Miguel and his men follow behind. Really, Donnie, I don't think this is a good idea. They sit, and an anxious Miguel immediately lights another cigarette. A pretty young waitress walks to their table. Donnie's eyes light up, as they always do when he sees a pretty girl, and speaks the only Spanish he knows, a sleazy pickup line, of course. Hace calor aquí, o eres tú. The girl ignores him, which surprises Donnie, as this usually works. Miguel tells the girl, Bacalde con agua en una café, por favor. She walks to the back, and Donnie's gaze is latched onto the girl's behind. So he doesn't even notice how the bartender has been glaring at him as soon as he walked into the room. You see, Donnie, things have really changed, and we should probably get out of here. What do you mean? Is Carlos still working with me? Are you trying to fuck me? I flew all the way down here. No, 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 it's not that. You better not. I hear I sold a lot of tickets. What's the house, anyway? We sold all tickets in advance, and we'll open it up, and we'll probably have 30,000 persona, 30,000 people, amigo. 30,000? Haha. <laughs> it was that promo we sent you, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, about that. I know the Puerto Rican fans are wild, so I wanted to cut a wild promo with a little extra space. Yes, amigo. Maybe a little bit too stiff, to be honest. Oh, come on. I'm trying to draw a house here, build some heat, and it looks like I succeeded. Our fans can get very, como salvaje, angry, and things you said, well, uh, well... The girl returns. Donnie turns his chair, presenting his crotch to her. I have a seat just for you, mi amor. He winks at her, and she puts the drinks down on the table. She steps away as Donnie smiles at her and misreads the dirty look she's giving him. Oh boy, these Puerto Rican girls are babes. You think I have time to take this waitress into the back? Miguel notices the bartender staring at them as his cigarette has been smoked down to a nub. Donnie grabs a drink, and Miguel makes a quick decision to slam his hand on top of Donnie's glass. Miguel takes the glass of rum and pours it out onto the floor. Donnie looks up confused, and the bartender on the other side of the room shakes his head angrily, and wipes the bar as he pouts. Amigo, I think that bartender did something to your drink. Why the fuck would he do that? That it's girlfriend or something? Donnie, listen to me. You piss off the entire island. The things you said in the promo about Puerto Ricans in the mud, they've been playing the clip on the news every night, amigo. Every night. Miguel unfolds a copy of the newspaper and puts it on the table as he lights another cigarette. On the front of the paper is a huge picture of Donnie Gold and a headline quote in Spanish. You insulted the people of Puerto Rico in ways no other heel has before. And then you promised to sleep with all of our women and gave them instructions on where to meet you? Donnie looks at him with a sly grin, trying to figure him out. This a rib? Come on, Miguel. This is heat. Ticket selling heat. That's a... We have to go, por favor. We have to go. Miguel drops some cash on the table and they walk out. Finally. Donnie looks at the waitress as he is dragged away and mimics a phone motion to the side of his head, mouthing the words, I'll call you. She looks away and then he notices five faces peeking out from the kitchen. Five faces staring a hole through his head. Donnie is driving with Miguel in the limo. Listen, you can't stay at the hotel anymore. It's not safe. You're staying at my house, amigo. What's going on here? Donnie, you started a sort of international incident here. I've been fighting with the government, the government, and the policia, force of all week. They can't keep track of all the death threats against you. The governor of Puerto Rico, I mean the governor, wanted to ban you from coming to the island. A policia is fighting me about the extra security. And they are worried their own men will harm you. But you said over 30,000 people here tonight, right? See. Si. Then I don't see what the problem is. 
Just be careful, Donnie. You're playing with fire, a bit as it is. Tonight, don't do anything more to incite this crowd. This year, our riots have become more tame, more controllable. This will be our biggest show in the years, and I don't want to mess this up at all. Don't worry, Miguel. I'm the world champion and I've wrestled all over the world. I know exactly what to do. This, you have a bar at home? Yes. You have a housekeeper or something? Yes, why? I am very stressed after that flight from hell. And after that waitress looked at me, I'm also very horny. So when we get to your place, I'm going to have several drinks, and then someone is going to suck this cock. And if you don't have a housekeeper, then it's going to be you, pal. Miguel shakes his head and looks out the window. Yay, this cabron. Juan Lobriel Stadium, Bayamon, Puerto Rico. Donnie enters the locker room and sees his old friend and opponent for the show, Carlos Rivera. He's a stocky, well-built man with handsome features and bright white teeth. Go there, boy, you motherfucker! They shake hands. They haven't seen you since we worked that shot for Eddie Pichesky in Tallahassee. You ready for tonight, Carlos? Only if you shine up that belt on nice for me. Carlos laughs. You wish, Carlos. Maybe you work outside this little island of yours more than once a year. The WWA might finally look at you. But until then, I am, and always will be, the World Heavyweight Champion. Oh yeah! As the day turns into night, Donnie chats with some of the other American wrestlers on the card, and he can hear the crowd grow in size and intensity. Many of them say that's the largest crowd they've ever seen here. This gets confirmed by a stadium official who says they can't get an official number yet, as they think people have been sneaking in, but they're estimating 35,000 in a venue that only holds 30,000. Carlos and Donnie are seated at a table while Donnie cuts out two lines of cocaine with a razor blade onto a mirror. Diego Mieres, a masked wrestler who is also the new booker for CCW, sits down with them. So you've got the book now, Diego? Si, sí, Don. Donnie turns to Carlos. So what are we doing tonight? Diego answers. Listen, Don. It's been a long time since you worked Puerto Rico. This crowd is pretty wild. I know Carlos can't go over, but let's be gentle with them. No way. If we can draw this kind of house off one little promo, I want to come back down the road and do it all over again. I need to piss these people off. I need to screw Carlos. You already did piss them off. What you said at the... Tony, Tony, Tony. That's good, but uh, we don't want a riot or anything. Riot? They want a riot. A screw job is the only thing that makes sense tonight. I'm going to fuck you so bad, they'll be dying to see you beat me next time. And up to that point, I'm going to break every rule in the book. Donnie leans over and inhales a long line of coke with a straw. <laughs> oh, yeah. Carlos stares at him for a second, thinking on what he just said, and then mentally puts all responsibility on Donnie. Okay, champ, whatever you say. Carlos takes the straw. Donnie pinches his nose as he sniffs up every grain. Let's do the same finish we did in Tallahassee. Carlos turns his head and shouts, Castillo, and aquí. Carlos takes in a line as the referee walks over and listens to them. I put on the figure four. When the time is right, you reverse it. I'll sell the reversal and make the ropes. As I get up, you beat on me and work me towards the corner. Ref stops you from using the closed fist, and as you argue, I come up behind and hit you square in the nuts and pin you with both feet in the ropes. Uno, dos, tres. Donnie looks to Diego. That's a good finish, but, uh... But people are, are going oh, to that's ride. That's good, Tony. I like that. Uh, can I have that blade? And don't play my music. Play the U.S. National Anthem instead. It'll be great. As Donnie hands Carlos the razor blade, he wipes up the bits of coke from the mirror and rubs them on his teeth and gums, while Carlos cuts the blade in half with scissors and pulls out a roll of white medical tape. All the while, the promoter, Miguel, nervously chews on his nails, 
hearing everything. As he does the same warm-up routine he does every night before a match, Donny barely notices how many of the younger Puerto Rican wrestlers have been avoiding him, some even giving him dirty looks. Hey, Carlos, what's their problem? Donny, uh, the things you say in the promo, the, the young guys, they know it's at work, yet uh, they don't know it. You see, the kids in the mud, the women, that was pretty stiff. Donny shakes his head, perplexed. Come on, Danny. They are going to walk you out. An extremely tense Miguel calls. Danny walks over in his wrestling gear, hair fully fluffed, large feathery pink robe flowing. Six armed policemen surround him. Don't worry. They'll protect you. Danny, slightly confused, looks at Miguel standing next to Diego. Is all this really necessary? A recording of the U.S. National Anthem played throughout the stadium as Donnie steps out of the locker room and sees the crowd for the first time. It looked less like a sporting event and more like something out of the apocalypse. There were literally torches on poles throughout the stadium, creating this eerie, hellish glow in the night. The thick, humid air reeked of beer, sweat, and the cantina stand with their cheese hot dogs and their pincho kebab sticks of meat. If there were chairs in the stadium, they were long gone. Fans were not only standing on the ground, but leaping and jumping on top of each other just to see Donnie walk down the aisle. The roar of booze was like nothing Donnie ever heard before. He could literally feel it in his chest. The entire aisle was lined with police, who were already locked in a life or death struggle, to hold back this mouth-frothing mob which lurched forward every few seconds while curse words flew at Donnie in English and Spanish. Donnie moved forward with his hands on the shoulders of a cop who led this group. Garbage was flying into the aisle towards him. Donnie turned his head just in time to see the shadow of a 9-volt battery strike him straight in the cheek. As Donnie wiped the blood off his face, he was in disbelief that someone actually threw a fucking battery. Beers were being thrown all over his security force, dousing the policemen, eliciting cheers from any of the fans who saw it. The police in the aisle were pushing back on the people. As they approached the ring, a fan came flying off the shoulders of another and landed right on the officer to Donnie's right, taking him down immediately as Donnie saw a knife sticking out of the cop's arm that was clearly meant for him. As the other police wrestled the fan off, Donnie hopped up into the ring and got a full view of this crowd. It was indeed a sea of Puerto Ricans overflowing in this coliseum. Shadows and red glowing faces from the torchlight. He was told it was more than 30,000, but it may as well have been 100,000 in Donnie's eyes. His career was based on performing before large crowds who hated him. But this, this was on a different level. Someone threw a flaming American flag which caught on the ropes. Someone from the ring crew pulled it down to the ground and it was stomped out. Carlos was already in the ring, playing it up for all it was worth. He stood stoically, glaring at Donnie, holding a Puerto Rican flag on a pole. And then they played the Puerto Rican national anthem. The crowd burst into cheering and then stood in unison. There wasn't one fan that didn't sing along word for word with this Spanish song, with the passion and intensity as if they were literally fighting for their country's survival. He heard a loud cheer from one section of the stands, and his eyes darted over to see a large scarecrow held up by a long stick with a blonde wig and white robe, which was now engulfed in flames. Donnie's eyes widened as people backed away, forming a circle around this effigy of Diamond Donnie Gold as men swarmed to it, stomping it to pieces. Stomping him to pieces. Suddenly, Donnie's grand vision of non-stop cheating and a screwjob finish didn't seem like such a great idea anymore. Donnie locked up with Carlos. He forced Carlos towards the corner. And in a spot that he's done a thousand times, 
went to poke his opponent's eye. Normally, this is a minor move, and you quickly move on to the next one. But when Donnie tapped Carlos's eyebrow with his thumb, as if he was poking him in the eyeball, Carlos acted like Donnie stabbed him in the face with a rusty hunting knife. Carlos slammed himself to the mat on his back, flopping around like a fish, all the way out of the ring into the floor, completely overselling, completely over the top. And it worked like a charm. The fans were incensed. A fan leapt the guardrail to check on his hero before police tackled him. More garbage flew towards the ring, along with these tiny golf ball-sized pits from some kind of fruit that felt like rocks when they hit them. Carlos stood up on the floor and now pretended to be blind, waving his arms around, trying to find out where to go. Donnie turns to the ref in the ring. Jesus Christ, does he have to sell it like that? It was the first move. Taking the cue from Carlos's movements, Donnie grabbed Carlos by the hair to pull him up from the floor back into the ring. He pulled him through the ropes and flipped him over in a snap man and knelt beside him, wrapping his arm around Carlos's chin from behind in a rear chin lock. And that's when he noticed the blood. Donnie acted like he was squeezing extra hard and Carlos screamed in pain as blood began to trickle from his eyebrow. God damn it, Carlos, you kick yourself already? Am I getting good color? Trying to sell the eye? Blood from an eye poke? In the first minute? You trying to get me killed? No, like you say, build good heat for rematch. Rematch? Rematch? All Donnie could think about was how he was going to get out of this place alive. They worked the rest of the match, a standard series of sequences that he's worked with hundreds of others. It always works, always gets a great entertaining bout with almost anyone. But Carlos, Carlos was out of control. His selling was so over the top that if this was another town, fans might not have bought it. It might have looked fake, but this crowd was not only eating it up, they were devouring it. They were consumed by their hatred of Diamond Donnie Gold. Carlos was already a national hero as the top babyface in Puerto Rico for years, but the circumstances of tonight were turning him into a legend. They were living and dying with Carlos's every move. And it really clicked for Donnie when the fans started throwing mud into the ring. Apparently, fans had poured beer on sections of dirt and had made mud. The same mud that he said that they played in when they were kids instead of getting an education. And that was the first time Donnie thought that maybe his promo was a little stiff. Carlos's face was now a crimson mask of blood, and Carlos sold it like he was going to pass out. He quivered his legs, and the rabid crowd was acting like their brother, or their father was dying, getting killed by this loudmouth, white, American wrestler who shit on their country and their people. Donnie lost count of the number of fans who charged the ring, the number of bottles, rocks, and garbage thrown into the ring, the amount of mud thrown or the fire started throughout the stadium. This entire scene was becoming a blur. Even the sounds of angry men banging what sounded like lead pipes on the sides of chairs as some sort of call to war or life-threatening warning to him was blurring out. For a second, he wondered if his plane did crash after all, and he was actually in hell, being punished for a lifetime of debauchery and womanizing. Donnie clamped in a figure four leg lock on Carlos, and he turned his head and saw an innocent child in the front row. A pretty young girl, eight years old, maybe seven. He thought of how his niece was the same age the last time he saw her back home with his family. She was with what appeared to be her grandmother in a night at the matches, foraging memories of a lifetime with her abuela. And then he locked eyes with her big soft brown peepers and her cute round face as she looked straight at him and spoke loudly and strained but clearly spoke in English. Fuck you, Tony Gold. It was then he had serious doubts if he would ever see his niece again, or anyone's niece for that matter. Donnie snaps back into reality as the ref shouts to Donnie, Take it home. Donnie immediately recalls the finish that begins with this figure four and ends up with him hitting Puerto Rico's national hero in the groin and then pins him by putting half his body on the ring ropes, all without the referee's knowledge. In what would be one of the greatest cases of cheating in Caribbean sports history, 
and one of the most tragic travesties and injustices Puerto Rico has ever suffered, all ending with Donnie Gold's head on a stick while his body is doused in flaming gasoline and Puerto Ricans dance around his body, stomping out the flames just like that flag. Carlos looks to the crowd for energy and support as they will him to turn Donnie over. Carlos raises his arm and uses the crowd's energy and his shifted weight, and finally, Gold flips onto his belly with his legs tied up in Carlos's, thus reversing the pain from Carlos onto Donnie. The fans go crazy as Donnie screams as if electric shocks were being bolted through his legs and the ref switches positions, this time asking Donnie if he wants to submit. And to the complete surprise of the referee and Carlos Rivera, Donnie shouts, Yes! Ring the bell! I give up! I give up! Ring the bell! The referee, surprised but still honoring the in-ring audible of the champ, signals to the timekeeper at ringside. As the referee hands the belt, to the new WWA World Champion, Carlos Rivera. Donnie quickly rolls under the bottom rope to the floor, doing his best to turn invisible, crouching down as he tugs the shirt of a cop facing the crowd. Get me the fuck out of here. The officer signals to another, and the two cops manage to sneak Donnie out down the aisle as the fans are far too distracted by Carlos Rivera's victory celebration. A shower, Donnie Gold angrily packs away his boots and wrestling trunks as Carlos finally returns to the locker room after a celebration that seemed to last forever. Oh, thank you, Donnie. I'm truly blessed that you believe that I can be world champion. I make you proud. Carlos, you're not the world champion of shit. Now give me my belt back. Carlos starts to unbutton the belt. The match. I win. People happy. I drop it back to you. Rematch. Three months from now. No? Rematch? I'm never coming back here, no fucking way. Besides, I am booked at Nashville tomorrow night, then Louisville, and then I'm out to St. Louis. And they're expecting to see Diamond Donny Gold, the World Heavyweight Champion. Carlos puts it on the table gently. But Tony, why? You changed the finish in the ring. What's done is done. Carlos, I changed the finish because if I went over on you, a full-scale riot was about to break out which would have ended with my lifeless body being dragged through the streets of San Juan. No, no, they not like that. They just like to have fun. Fun? You call that fun? Well, at least I know in my mind I beat the great Tony Gold to be world champion, even if for just one night. Carlos extends his hand to shake. Donnie reluctantly shakes it back. We had a good match, no? Carlos, tonight you were amazing. It was the best. Thank you, brother. Now, someone get me the fuck out of here. Miguel chimes in. We have to wait. When the crowd is this big, cars can't get in or out to the locker room. And we're oversold tonight. It's going to be another hour at least, amigo. At least another hour. Donnie shakes his head. Wait for me to shower, Donnie. And I got some blow for you. Some sweet Puerto Rican shit. Better than that baby powder you sniff back in Atlanta. I don't know why I'm even being nice to you. All you fuckers. Why didn't anyone warn me about this place? Southeastern Championship Wrestling Offices, Atlanta, Georgia. Nigel Davies is speaking on the phone at a desk. Listen, Miguel, it's up to you. Say the referee made a mistake, or the contract was for a non-title match. It's your television, and no one is going to see it outside of Puerto Rico. So say whatever you want. But there was no world title change in San Juan. Are we clear? I know it's not your fault, Miguel, but it is what it is. Nigel hangs up the phone, starts looking through his Rolodex again. Henderson asks, What about the wrestling fans in the U.S.? How do we explain this to them? There were no cameras there. Only a couple of photographs, maybe. Nigel, thumbing through, getting closer. Who are you calling? Pro Wrestling Digest. Mr. Williams, it's Nigel. 
You might hear some whispers that Donny Gold lost the world title to Carlos Rivera in Puerto Rico. That never happened. Do you understand? It never happened. Period. Of course. Thank you. We'll see you next month. What about the rest of the board? We need to clear this with them at all? Leslie, the Alliance board are the last ones we want hearing about this. WWA title changes are carefully decided and voted upon. That's why I'm doing this now, to protect the Alliance. As far as history books and anything else is concerned, this was all just a dream. A terrible, terrible dream. Big thank you and faftai lava to Lloyd Anawai from the legendary Anawai wrestling family, who was the special guest voice for episode number six. Follow this member of the Samoan dynasty by following him on Twitter at Lloyd Anawai, that's L L O Y D A N O A I, or at Facebook at Lloyd Anawai, and he can also be contacted for wrestling and acting bookings at L Anawai One, that's L A N O A I number one at AOL.com. Lots of exciting things going on with Kings of the Ring. The word is spreading daily, and I want to thank you all for that. The Netherlands, Singapore, and Sweden are the latest countries to join in, and I'm happy to see the United Kingdom with a stranglehold on that number two spot. Even more fans than in Canada. Come on, Canadians. As the show grows, the story grows, and that means more new characters, which means more voices and more names. I had to bring in L.A. Smooth to help out with number six, and episode seven will feature another special guest voice actor. To find out who it is, follow us on Twitter at KingsOTR or on Facebook at KingsOTR1984 for that special announcement. As for the names, there have been over 50 characters referenced so far in this story with more on the way, and if you didn't see it already, I want to tell you how you can be one of them. That's right. Check out the website, kingsotr.com, for information on how you can literally be in the Kings of the Ring story by purchasing the naming rights to a character. That means you would be one of the new characters, meaning your name would be read aloud, just like I read Charlie Gotch, Freddie Fengler, Les Henderson, or the dozens and dozens of characters in the King's Verse. In Episode 7, we return to the mainland, and find out what AMW does in the wake of what happened to Charlie Gotch and the mass of star wrestlers about to jump to Empire. We are also introducing two more wrestlers from Southeast Championship Wrestling along with Miss Kitty and the co-owner Nigel Davies makes his first big move in the wrestling war. It's episode number seven, An Indecent Proposal. <laughs> 